KOPN Columbia, 89.5 FM. My name is Mike Hagan. This is Radio Orbit. I'll be back with you in just a few minutes. Right. I'm waiting for you. And maybe you're waiting for me. Maybe not. Either way, uh, my name is Mike Hagan. This is Radio Orbit. Good evening, everybody, whoever you are, wherever you may be, whenever you might be listening to this program. Welcome to the program. It is Radio Orbit. It's Monday, the 19th of November. 
2018. Big thanks to the crew setting things up for us here on these Monday nights. Before we get going, we'll say thank you to Woody. Woody Atkins gets things going every Monday, 3 to 5 p.m. with Real Deal Country Show. Fantastic traditional country, Western swing, Ameripolitan music. And before we continue, I will say that Woody Atkins is actually up for the 2018 Ameripolitan Music Awards DJ of the Year. And I would love it if our our own Woody Atkins could actually get that award for once. He's been on the bill for like five years. He's uh, uh, been nominated, I think, for the last five or six years. And if you're not familiar with Ameripolitan Music or the the Ameripolitan Music Awards, uh, what you can do is go to Ameripolitan.com and you can learn a little bit about the music that uh, Woody is such a fan of and a, a great promoter and advocate of. And you can also vote for him for the 2018 Ameripolitan Music Awards DJ of the Year. I did, and I hope you do too. That's my new bumper sticker. Vote for Woody. All right, uh, before Woody, we have uh, the Aquarius uh, show, or uh, Age of Aquarius, I think, and that's earlier in the afternoon, but I caught the tail end of it. Very mellow, chilling music uh, for your Monday afternoon. Of course, uh, then we have, after Woody's show, Alan and Rob with Left Ahead Radio. They're talking politics. Great show tonight, uh, and Tech Radio, always doing great stuff with regard to the world of technology. We had James Tucker sitting in for the wonderful Kelvin, uh, Kelvin, <laughs> exactly right, uh, Kevin Walsh tonight, Jazz Plus Blues equals Lady Einstein, New Wave Radio Theater, just getting wrapped up a few minutes ago, good music, good talk, good news, and you're listening to it here on KOPN Columbia, 89.5 FM. All right, uh, I'm going to put another piece of music on here because I actually have a phone call that I have to take because it has to do with one of the guests that I'm going to have early uh, uh, in the first hour of the show. So let's play this song called St. James from the Ina Cook Band. We'll be hearing music from Ina Cook for most of the program tonight. And this one is called St. James. Back in just a few minutes, this is Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia.
from the Anna Cook Band. That one's called St. James. It's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. All right, it's about a quarter after 11 on the 12th. Actually, no, it's the 19th of November 2018. Last week, I was absolutely thrilled to have Andreas Antonopoulos on the program. He really is the go-to guy in the Bitcoin crypto World, And if you really want to understand what Bitcoin is and why it's important, well, that program last week is a good place to start. You might also start at his website, which is Antonopolis.com. And we addressed a lot of the skeptical uh, questions on on the side of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, that stuff, too. So uh, anyway, absolutely thrilled to have Andreas last week. If you miss a show, you can listen online anytime from the archives at www.mikehagan, M-I-K-E-H-A-G-A-N, mikehagan.com. And also, we had the just wonderful, lovely songs of Dylan Walsh, a fine young musician from Ireland who made his way to Nashville, where he makes his home now. And we heard a bunch of songs from his 2018 release. Actually, just a few weeks ago, I think this record was released. But anyway... Dylan Walsh, and the record was called All Manner of Ways, and it's still called that. And if you want to find out more about Dylan, you can get on the web and go to www.dylanwalsh.com. That's D-Y-L-A-N-W-A-L-S-H-E. It's a great record, and like I said, more on the web about Dylan at dylanwalsh.com. Of course, you can go to my music archives anytime and link up to any of the art, uh, the artists that I've featured on the program and see what they're up to. Anyhow, excellent music uh, from Ireland via Nashville, Tennessee. All right, today's program, or tonight's program, I should say, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. She is a PhD and master's in astrophysics, nuclear physics, and engineering. She is an extremely accomplished and respected scientist, but one who also happens to be interested in sort of the stranger sides of, of uh, science, the paranormal. And uh, it'll be an interesting conversation tonight with Dr. Rauscher. It's back to St. Louis for music tonight. This time we have the Ina Cook Band. Ina is an awesome singer, talented songwriter, got a great voice, and I had the pleasure of welcoming her and her brother Ando and their trumpet player Kyle to the station a few months ago. They were on a program that I do on Friday mornings called Open Mic Radio, and uh, that's 9 o'clock every Friday morning, and we bring in local and regional musicians and talk to them about the road and life on the road and music and how they got to where they are. And oftentimes they play music in the studio live for us. And Ina and her brother Ando and Kyle played some songs for us back in, I guess it was like May or June. And anyway, that's when I was introduced to her for the most part. And we're going to play songs from her band, the Ina Cook Band, for the rest of the night. We've heard a couple already. We started off with the uh, the open track from her most recently produced record and it's just called Ina Cook and the song is called Brand New Knife actually maybe the record is called Brand New Knife I guess I'll have to, uh, I guess I'll have to pull up the uh, the cover here because I don't have it with me here I just grabbed the CD and it's in the player so I can't tell you but anyway great stuff from Ina Cook we heard Brand New Knife and then we heard St. James we'll hear more from Ina Cook and the band throughout the rest of the program tonight Okay. All right. When we come back, I'm going to take a break here for a minute. And when we come back, 
We're going to cover what I think is an important local story. We're going to talk with uh, a woman named Marguerite Rapold live here in the studio in just a few minutes, and we'll be talking about, oh, I don't know, abuse sort of in the so-called service industry and presenting a pretty stunning example from our own community right here in Columbia. That and a whole bunch more coming up in uh, in just a bit here. Okay, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. Here's another one from the Ina Cook Band. This one's called No Time. I'll be back with you in just a few minutes.
right no time no time for a lot of things these days but uh what we do have time for is a letter that i'm going to read to y'all it's mike by the way and you listen to radio orbit on kopn columbia 89.5 fm and the letter i'm going to read uh i think it's the first time it's been shared probably publicly here in columbia but uh eventually i'm sure it'll be sent to some other people uh it's written by a young woman who i think i can say her name is that right her name is marguerite rapold and uh she had an interesting experience, not, not a particularly pleasurable one, uh, a week or two ago locally here in town. And it's, uh, it sort of strikes a chord with things that are sort of prominent in the social cultural scene these days. And I think that it's worthwhile to talk about it a little bit. So I'm just going to read uh, a good chunk of the letter that she wrote here first. It's an op-ed that, uh, that she wrote a few days ago or a week ago or whatever. At any rate, I'm going to read it right now, and then we'll talk to Marguerite about you know, the scene in general, okay? All right, this is uh, the way it goes. There are many ways to approach this. I have sat with these thoughts and I'm simply trying to wrap my head around each perspective. However, I feel that it would be a disservice to those involved if I did not address the situation in the hopes that it would not happen again. I work in the service industry and something unfortunate occurred. My aim is to correct it for the people that are seen as servant to other humans in the world, not the industry. This past weekend, I had two tables at the latter half of the evening. I took both orders, rang them, and both had entrees that had run out. Returning to the tables, I let them know that we did not have the items that they had requested and apologized. Of the two tables, the first that was seated was kind, understanding, flexible, and had arrived with a reservation. The second table was understandably frustrated as they had waited for a seat and now were told that the entrees that they had wanted were no longer available. While it was not what they wanted to hear, the mother at the table was kind. The father and the son were honestly intoxicated and belligerent throughout the entire service. At this point, I was not sure what to do, but attempted to pacify them both. I was sent to the kitchen twice as the father said they would walk if they didn't have their food in five minutes. I had delivered free food, bread, as well as appetizers on the house. Maria, our on-staff manager, had spoken to them as well. Their food arrived, and the son denied ordering the duck in place of his filet, so we removed that, even though that was what he did indeed order. We had already addressed comping the entire bill. At this point, I passed the table to check on to the other family. The son got up from his seat, intercepted me, and started screaming a bunch of F-bombs in my face, requesting a bill that I told him he did not have. We had already taken care of it. The bill had been comped. The father from the other table stood up and intervened, at which point the individual returned to his seat, and they all left. Now, this goes on a little bit further, and we're not going to go too deeply into who was involved, but it's uh, somebody who you might consider a prominent member of our local community here and for you know for the sake of not making a scene we're, we're not going to mention names but my guest marguerite is here and it took a lot of courage to write that letter a lot of people were there when it happened a lot of people witnessed it and we're going to talk to her a little bit not just about that particular incident but about the general state of affairs with regard to the way people treat people, I guess, in, uh, in the world and, and certainly when you walk into a bar or a restaurant. So without further delay, I will say, hello, Marguerite, why don't you grab that microphone and get a little bit closer to it if you don't mind. Hi, how's it going? It's going, yeah. Hi, how are you doing there? I'm good. The irony is losing your voice, you know, a day before you go onto radio, but i um, good. Um, well, I know you've had a long day and you've been traveling a lot and moving and doing a lot of things, so I appreciate you making it down here. No, I really appreciate having an opportunity to talk about this. And um, as you kind of mentioned already, uh, the goal is not to try to attack another individual. It's actually the opposite. It's to discuss something that um, so many people experience whether and how they deal with it. So, 
really that was a, a writing on two different ways to handle a situation that's frustrating and what people choose to do. Mm-hmm. All right. So do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the scene in which it happened? This is a local restaurant. Are we allowed to talk about where it happened? Um, I have already, I've already talked to the owner who was initially the person that actually told me, like he sent me the information saying, is this this person? And I was like, oh yeah, it is. Like you said, another server recognized him. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I have permission from pretty much everyone involved to say, yes, it was at Sycamore. Mm -hmm. Um, And Sanford is the person that sent me the image of it, of this person. And yeah, I think that it's pretty open. I just really don't want this to become like worse than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. I, in my opinion, what was going on has a lot more to do with some insecurity issues and dissatisfaction. And so, yeah, it's just, I'm not trying to like call anybody out because I want to be positive in this, mm-hmm. you know. So is it something uh, that you see common in other words it's it's an example that happened to you recently but is it something that you see you know regularly in other words are, are we talking about the way people are treated in general when they walk into a restaurant or a bar or something like that certainly that's more what i'm i would like to address is that this is one specific example um you know like we can name names if we need to mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it is a general issue that i've observed over many many years and it's just it feels very unfortunate for like our society to to make those decisions um and i think a lot of it is very subconscious and so Mm. that's what's frustrating Mm. it's basically i'm just trying to like help to say it's okay to like feel your feelings and understand them but I think there's a disconnect between a lot of people's feelings in society and Well, and what's appropriate behavior. to share with other people. In other words, I mean, you can feel this way or that way, but it doesn't mean that you can jump down somebody's throat because you couldn't get a filet, you know? Right, um, yeah. I think uh, I'm a little bit older than you, and I've been around a little bit, and I've, uh, or I've spent plenty of time at bars and restaurants. And even as a, as a patron, somebody who hasn't, I mean, I've, I've, done my share actually in the service industry when I was a lot younger but to be honest the world's a little bit different now and sometimes I'm actually just stunned by the way that people treat you know people that are working at wherever and and oftentimes it's women and there's a different sort of abuse I think I see I see women getting a different sort of abuse than than men they both get it um, men are demeaned and made to feel like they're like like mice or something. Well, I think that's and, a large part of the problem is the conditioning we all experience, you know, from an early upbringing, and what you're told you're supposed to be versus who you actually want to be. Hmm. I think that's a very important factor in it. So, a lot of the times when you see people that even subconsciously like don't even realize they're going through trauma, they have experienced it. Sure. And they're told they're not allowed to feel it. So ultimately, I think that's what this comes down to, possibly. I don't pretend to know everything. Um, I think once you start to think that you do, that's going to just exacerbate everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I really do. I'm not asking for special treatment because I'm a woman at all. Um, However, you are right that all of us have certain like archetypes that someone has an attitude toward. Mm -hmm. So I was taught to treat this person who is like this, this way. Mm -hmm. I have seen this demonstrated and therefore this is how I'm gonna behave in this Sort of follow the the lead and do what your dad does or something like that. I think there was a a little bit of that that went on with this incident that you had. The guy seemed to be sort of following the lead of his father. Well, I think that definitely there was a posturing aspect at the end because he was very, he was intoxicated, as I said, but also like he didn't speak up until the end after his father was fairly um, aggressively belligerent. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of more like I just feel for everybody in the situation. But I think, yeah, demonstration expectation has a lot to do with it and how we kind of try to find out who we are. And if you don't stand up against um, things that you can just blatantly see or wrong because you're personally affected by Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. repercussions of it if you don't do what someone tells you is right 
then I think that's kind of the major major base of it. At yeah. Least. yeah, that's what we should be doing. Uh, and in fact, there's been, I mean, if 2018 wasn't the year for that, I don't know which one was. And we're supposed to recognize when people are being treated uh, unfairly and, and, and disrespected and, and, and abused, frankly. So when it happens around here, you know, we should we should recognize it too. Columbia uh, prides itself on being a place that, you know, that uh, recognizes those those sorts of things. So, so yeah, I mean, it really comes down to how you treat other people and why. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're spending your money in their place of business or if they're spending money in yours. I mean, you should treat each other with respect and. Uh, and certainly not with belligerence, you know. So, so this is what we're trying to tr- trying to avoid. And when you have when you have people in the community who think they can do it, they think they kind of get a free pass or something for some reason because maybe they, I don't know, maybe they got some money or maybe they've got a you know fancy family or something. I don't know, you know. Well, I think that again goes back into the compensation aspect of it, where if oh, if I make so much money, mm. then I am therefore I'm better to. than another person. I can do whatever I want. But yeah. it ultimately comes out of a some sort of source of unhappiness that's internal. Because mm. I don't think you can really satisfy your own human heart with just filling it with a bunch of shit. Like, <laughs> and, but that's, again, it's, it's more a societal thing. We've kind of turned into, we've kind of forgotten, like, who we are as who we used to be, you know, like we used to look out for each other because we had to, it was like a survival aspect, right? Community. Um, That still, I think is very much um, present, but there, the division of um, reputation, class, creed, race, all of that is so extreme at this point that um, silly things like this, this is, You know, one evening of my life that was a two-hour portion of my life. Like, it's not the end of the world. However, it's an example of something that happens in on tiny moments like that, and also in like genocide. You know, Mm. it's just Mm. more talking about the attitude and where it came from and how we can solve that than you know anything else. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you can you can expand the metaphor, and it's the way you treat people in general. You know, you can see the way a country treats people. You know, just uh, and it's sort of a fractal thing, I guess, when you look at it. So. It really is kind of exponential. I had um, an interesting question posited to me the other day, mm-hmm. and it was: so, what's the interest most interesting problem to solve? Hmm. Someone was talking about creating a game um, and gameplay and challenge and all of that. There's a lot of strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just automated, like, it's like, oh, it's the Kobayashi Maru. (laughs) The Star Trek. That's the most interesting problem because you lose either way, but that ethical question of context is so much more interesting to me, at least. That um, So you can set up a parameter. You can say... Do you kill 15 people or do you kill one? Um, And you're like, obviously, I kill one with my trolley or train. And then they go, well, the one is your son. So I think it really comes back to that, like the way people think about things, because context is everything. And Mm -hmm. if we forget, like, our own attachment to other people, you don't really realize, like, the most important question. All right. So, um... What about you? I know you very sort of peripherally. We've met a couple of times. You're an artist as well, but you, you work in the restaurant. Do you have, I think you're, obviously you're a writer too. And uh, what, what, what do you want to do? Because you've got great aspiration and you have great thoughts about all the stuff. You know, you recognize some of the things that are troublesome and you're not being mean about it. You're just trying to point, point it out. And uh, so. I mean, I think I've, I'm pretty split between all of the different projects and, um, Mostly it's about observation. I think that at its core, it is exactly this conversation. Um, however, there are different formats and mediums that I work in to try to do the same kind of work, I guess. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just moved back here two months ago and I actually was born here, but didn't have really any reason to be here and somehow found myself here. <laughs> so. Columbia is um, weird like that. Yeah, full circle <laughs> shit. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, I didn't expect to be talking to you about this specifically. Right no, now. nor did I. I did not plan on doing this for, for the beginning of the radio show. I, I, I normally have a sort of structured thing that I do, but I'm, I'm glad that I ran into you last week and we decided to do it because I don't like stuff like this. I don't like it. I don't like, uh, I don't like when people are treated meanly and it happens often enough and I know that it happens a lot. And so when it happens and it's really obvious and, it, and, and it can be pointed out where other people were involved and know it, uh, then there's no, you know there's no no reason not to talk about it and uh, like I said before I hang around enough that I've seen both men and women treated really poorly by people that walk in to an establishment thinking that they run the place or that those people just because they work there have to pretty much do whatever they demand and and it's just not uh, it's not cool and it's not fair and it's just no no, no way to be acting in in 2018. Uh, yeah, well, I think the year is pointless. <laughs> there is definitely um, so much angst going on that a lot of people haven't talked about for a long time. However, a lot of people have been talking about this stuff for a long time, and it still hasn't necessarily changed. It's just more exposed, I feel. Hmm. Um, the climate allows it to be more exposed. It's, uh, it's kind of like technology where exponentially it is rapidly it's going more and more and more and your kind of processing time is shorter and shorter to deal with whatever is going on in like your day or um all of your your bank account or exactly what you were saying before i mean exponentially things are amped up and it's just like Take a fucking beat once in a while, dude. You know, we're on the radio here, young I'm Marguerite. Sorry. Watch your I'm language. Sorry. Right That's all right. It's okay. <laughs> no, but I, I appreciate your passion because it's it, it's true. Uh, people need to, <laughs> to to take a chill. You know. Yeah, people need to have their space and also their community. And um, yeah, I don't think that aggressive anything is really gonna solve anything. Well, you know. Yeah, that's a whole nother side of it because we live in a culture that literally, you know, thrives on aggressive behavior. I mean, I'm before we came here tonight, I was not by choice, but I was uh, watching the Monday Night Football game, which is on right now, and it's the Kansas City Chiefs playing the Los Angeles Rams. Big game if you're a football fan, you know. And I appreciate that you like your games, you like your sports teams or whatever, but certainly the the whole culture around around that is aggression uh who can essentially beat the snot out of the other person you know uh, or the other team as as best they can even the language that that's wrapped around many of those events you know the, the long pass is called a bomb yeah. <laughs> i mean well, it's just you know it's, it's wrapped up in our culture and it's so hard it's so hard to tease it out you but know what do you think about so i did i played competitive sports my mm -hmm. entire life mm -hmm you leave it on the field right as an athlete typically that's kind of the attitude well, however the, the idea, fan yeah. base mm -hmm. a lot of the times will be hmm. the most intense individuals you'll ever yeah, meet absolutely yeah. um so yeah. again i think it calls back to that like seeking um representation for yourself or an identity um and i think it's great like i i love sports i love the games um i love playing them but there's a difference between that and a disconnect like mm. again i think that it's like a um a place it's an output you know it's a place for people to put those emotions that aren't recognized on a daily basis and um it is a source of camaraderie right so it's oh, your yeah, like yeah, your yeah. pack yeah for sure uh, uh the problem is for the fans in other words when you're playing the game uh, yeah, you leave it on the field because that that's your okay. that's where you put it out, yeah. right? And then you leave it there because I mean, you really don't have any more. At the end of a game, you, you're probably going to be wiped out if you played a tough game, you know. And the fans don't leave anything on the field. They're, they they're in fact the games almost build up frustration mm -hmm. in the fan. Definitely, um, you know, if their team wins, they 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 have a huge amount of energy that they want to expend somewhere, and sometimes they do that in a in a creative or a destructive manner depends on who it is and how it goes down and, and then if they lose heck i know people 
their, their freaking team loses and it ruins their whole week. Yeah. And it's like, dude, it's, you know, it's just a game and you weren't even playing the game. And in fact, you, you don't even know any of those people. Uh, you know, well, you, you see their names on the screen, but, but you really, you don't even know who the hell they are. And, and it's amazing that they get so wrapped up in, well, in, in attached, something like that, you know, and attached because I mean, a lot of like, again, we want to be connected and we want to hmm. have that familial kind of feeling. But I think it really is like not to get super out there with anything, but um, what I'm trying to figure out, I think it's kind of that hybrid that as a species, <laughs> like us as humans, we are so cognitive and intellectual and also very primal and very like base survival that it is kind of like, you know, the cheesy step with with thing, which I read when I was 16. I never knew anything about its, <laughs> like reputation, but the duality of human beings is extremely complicated. Um, and trying to strike the balance, I think, is what we just need to strive for. I think that's the best we can do. But if you ignore one side and then you ignore the other, you're going to end up split and you're going to be mad the whole time. Right, right. Yeah, we, we're... we're Culturally, right now, it's a very difficult situation because people are having such a hard time talking to one another. It's everybody's so mad all the time. It seems like, whether it's politics or, or whether they can't get their food on time, <laughs> you know, it's like everybody's so angry and and, uh, gosh, uh, th th those sort of uh, emotions cloud your judgment and they make you uh, very very prone to make bad decisions and uh, really not healthy in general to, to go around like that. So I agree with you, Margaret. I think that just take a breath and take a step back and, you know, realize that, you know, we're all living in the same thing here and we're just trying to, trying to make our way, you know? Well, and I think that um, just one of the last thoughts that I don't think that people do take enough personal time for themselves mm. because we have to keep going all of the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of it is just like, allowing yourself to say i need this moment to process and being able to vocalize that um i have never realized how much like i don't even like using the term mental illness because there's so many varieties and versions but it's like every person that i talk to is going through something and is trying to figure out what's wrong with them and instead maybe just like taking a step back and mm -hmm. And letting themselves rest might be a good idea right. once in a while. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, we've always, like now we just have to keep pushing through and no one gets time for themselves. I think that's pretty much what I'm trying to say. So. Yeah, I think I think uh, one of my great teachers back in, 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 in the day used to say that no matter who you were, where you were, you had to take just a little bit of time during the day, every day that was just for you and close yourself off from whatever else was going on, clear your mind, do something, you know, put on your favorite music, you know, dance naked, whatever it is that, that you want to do for you mm -hmm. with nobody else involved. And that's your sort of sacred space, you know, exactly. and, and without that, with a, without a regular visit to that space, it, it becomes a, uh, you know, life can become very heavy and very troublesome. And not that it isn't anyway, but that certainly can help you uh, to try to keep your focus and keep your compass setting at least, uh, you know, from spinning because the world is just a blooming, buzzing confusion yeah. right now. And, we, and, view, and we view saying, all right, I don't want to talk about this right now as a privilege or as like being a jerk. But hmm. no, I mean, like, I feel like the more that we say, I totally hear what you're saying. Give me five minutes. I'll be right back. And just to like, you know, I mean, meditation has been around for a long time, not mm -hmm. going that far um, with it. But I mean, I've meditated and it's definitely helped, but it's so hard to find that time. And mm -hmm. I think everyone's just like, like you said, like just buzzing forward. But I do think that it is extremely um, helpful to process whatever this is that we call life. Yeah. All right. Well, Miss Marguerite, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I appreciate you coming down here. And I, you have a lot of guts for uh, for doing what you did. And you know, if you need a platform, if you need to come back on the radio, you let me know, and we'll you know talk about it again, and or if something comes up from this. But in the meantime, everybody out there, I mean, really, 
you know, think about the way you treat other people and, and think about what they're going through. You know, everybody has a life and everybody has their own challenges and it's not just about you. And, uh, we all should treat each other with respect regardless of what's going on out there because that's, uh, that's what a civilization is. There's no, there's no civilization without civility and we, we seem to be losing some of that. So anyway, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you soon, I hope, okay? Yeah. All right, that's uh, Marguerite Rapold, and I appreciate her coming down here and sharing her story with us, okay? All right, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia, 89.5 FM. Normally, we would do space weather and talk about some of the things that are happening in the skies above our heads, but we're going to kind of move a little bit forward because we're a little short on time. We're going to have a guest at the top of the hour here, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, uh, who... I'm excited to have on the air with us. She was on the air with me about 11 years ago, back in 2007, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Dr. Rauscher's been up to for the last 10 years. She's an extremely accomplished uh, scientist and uh, someone who I'm thrilled to be able to talk to for a few minutes, all right? Also, we would normally talk about, come on in, John. We would normally talk about well, I should say that uh, a kind mention for a few of the past tensors who have been on my mind this week. Uh, Terrence McKenna, for those who aren't familiar, he was a, a friend and a great man, someone who we lost about 18 years ago. He has a birthday that was just a few days ago on the 16th of November. He was born in 1946, but uh, if he was still with us, he would have had a birthday just a few days ago. So without going into too much detail, you know, do a web search for Terrence McKenna and see if you find anything out there that he's been involved with that you might find interesting. There's another man who is one of my favorites from back in the day. His name is Emmanuel Velikovsky. And Emmanuel Velikovsky is famous for a number of books. He was a psychologist, but he was also sort of a historian and, gosh, almost like uh, an archaeologist. And he was a very smart man who came up with a theory of... Well, I guess sort of an evolutionary theory, but more of like a geological historical theory that eventually was called catastrophism. And catastrophism is essentially the idea that the universe, the earth, the solar system, they don't change slowly. There's sort of a general theory in evolution and historical looks at, uh, you know, the deep past and the idea is that sort of things just kind of slowly move from one thing to another just sort of the slow crawl but uh, Velikovsky had the idea that it really wasn't like that it was more like things sort of got to a particular point and they sort of plateaued and they stayed there for a long long period of time until something catastrophic happened like a meteor hit the planet or there was a solar flare or a great flood perhaps anyway uh he was extremely uh prolific in his writings about this particular type of idea and uh, really ended up uh, going down in history because of it and his ideas are very interesting and and he backs them up with a lot of a lot, lot of very very good science actually so another person if you're looking to waste some time go look up Emmanuel Velikovsky all right uh, one last person who I'll mention is a woman whose name was Mira Richard and Mira was a woman who died in I guess about 1972 and she was an associate and a friend and a partner of uh, a yogi in India whose name was Sri Aurobindo, Aurobindo Ghosh and somewhere along the way in the last 10 or 12 years I was exposed to Aurobindo Ghosh's material and sort of his oh uh, epistemology perhaps is a good word for it and it's one of the only ones that I've ever heard of that actually makes sense to me and Mira Richard was a co-conspirator and collaborator with Sri Aurobindo and their concepts were groundbreaking and mind shattering to me and I think that of all of the religious ideas and spiritual pursuits, I think that the ideas of Mira, Mother Mira, and uh, 
and Sri Aurobindo are the most cogent and the most beautiful, actually, of, of any that I've ever heard. So once again, Terrence McKenna, Emmanuel Velikovsky, and Mother Mira, if you want to do some investigation into somebody who I actually have found very interesting, or people who I've thought were worth looking into, you might check them out, okay? All right, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. We'll be back in about five minutes with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, all right? In the meantime, in honor of uh, the service industry out there and all the girls and guys that are working and the fact that you have to put up with a whole bunch of stuff, we're going to play this one here from the Ina Cook Band. This is called Bad Taste in Men. It's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. <laughs> I got friends that say, girl, you need to change your ways if you want to find true love. Yeah, they might be right. I guess that's good advice. Oh, change, oh, change can be tough.
You're listening to Radio Orbit with Mike Hagan on KOPN 89.5 FM. All right, welcome back to the program, everybody. My guest tonight is a world-renowned physicist, a researcher, and a presenter. She holds PhDs in both astrophysics and nuclear physics and engineering. She has worked as a researcher at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for many years. She has been a research consultant to NASA, to the U.S. Navy. She's worked at the Stanford Research Institute. She was the chairman of the Fundamental Physics Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I could go on for quite some time, but I will abbreviate her credentials right there, and I will just say hello, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, welcome to Radio Orbit. Thank you for uh, having me on, Mike. <laughs> what a pleasure to have you back on the air. It's been, I, I went back in the archives, Elizabeth, and I, and I found out that it was, it was the 26th of November in 2007 was the last time that we talked on the radio. So it's been almost 11 years since we've been, been on the air. In fact, almost a week from today, and it'll be, one, it'll be 11 years. Crazy. Crazy November, yeah. <laughs> All right, so for the people that missed the program 11 years ago, before we get too deeply into things, let's you, do... You want me to recall that, right? <laughs> well, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, My just... My a... memory, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I read, a, a as a side note, there's a, that's crazy. There, there are certain, there are very few people, but some people literally remember almost every moment of their lives. It's crazy. I know. I actually worked with a couple to try to figure that out, but... I don't have any answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's talk a little bit about you first here. Uh, for people who are not familiar, I would like to do a little bit of background and let people know where you came from and how you got sort of where you are. You've done so many, many things over the years. But first of all, a little bit about where you came from. As a young uh, child even, where, where, where were you born, Elizabeth? I was born in Oakland, uh, California. Uh-huh. And my dad had a, a farm ranch uh, up in Napa County, so I grew up in the woods, which actually affected my life profoundly. Mm. And I'm, you know, just a nature person. Yes. Uh, some engineer said, oh my God, do you hug trees? <laughs> 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 well, why not? Uh, anyway, so I grew up in the country in the beautiful woods of uh, Napa County. And uh, my mother was interested in nature and science, mm -hmm. although not she was not a scientist, as far as I know, from my genealogy, I'm the only scientist for uh, generations back. But she, she encouraged me, and my dad discouraged me. He made fun of physicists and <laughs> ivory towers and uh, would laugh about it. <laughs> so that combination worked pretty well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when I was about four, I was uh, looking at the grass growing in the backyard, and I thought to myself, I'm not satisfied with my life, so i got to figure this out. Then I watched my parents being very sure of themselves, <laughs> and like they were always right, so I actually did some experiments and did some naughty things, and they punished me when I didn't do anything wrong, and punished me when I didn't punish me when I did, so I... So I think they're irrational, so I think I've got to work on this case. <laughs> so um, when I was eight, I met an astronomer talking about billions and billions of stars like Carl Sagan. Yes. And I turned on the BBC and Carl Sagan was on. And the sentence that came out when the TV came on said, he said, if Elizabeth Rauscher studies psychic phenomena, she'll destroy all of science and all of civilization. <laughs> I thought, my God, that's a lot of credit. I mean, <laughs> uh, maybe I did, though. I don't know. Not, not yet, anyway. <laughs> so um, to, so uh, then we moved to uh, Berkeley and in and view of UC Berkeley. So I um, uh, wanted to go to Berkeley. Um, um, and I, I hated grammar school. There's nothing in it. Wow. It's just totally junk. There's nothing to learn. Mm. But 
but I knew I needed to go to high school to go to college, so I did. And I started at Berkeley. And I majored in physics and chemistry. I was going to major in math as well, but I just didn't have time for all the courses. Hmm. Well, eventually I know you learned the math, and I know you used to build your own telescopes, too. Yeah, between 9 and 13, I built six telescopes. I didn't have all six at once because what I did is take some apart to make parts for the other ones. <laughs> I still have two. That you made yourself? Yeah. Yeah? Do you still use them? I mean, do you still use a telescope in, uh, in general to the look at the sky? The light pollution here is terrible, even though I live in sort of a rural area. Right. You got a lot of it's light pollution. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And um, it's too bad, you know. Um, I think that there's something really missing from the magic of when I grew up in the country, you could see the Milky Way mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. beautiful band across the sky and... Oh, my gosh, you know, to me, it's religious. I mean, it's just a, a gorgeous experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I've had some experiences. I, I, I had a friend that used to live up in the real high country, Colorado, and it didn't matter what time of year, but in the wintertime, it was really remarkable because it was when it was really cold. But, uh, but gosh, the view from there was stunning and if you if you if you see that as a human being i really don't i don't see how you can't be moved somehow uh just 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 the, the vastness of the, of the of the whole thing it's just stunning you know it's just magic and um then as i say i met this astro astronomer at eight and um i don't know how i built the telescopes because i didn't really have I just, uh, what, my mother was into photography, so she'd get assorted lenses. Mm -hmm. And I sent for Edmund for, Edmund Scientific for assorted lenses. And then I just, uh, my folks were very social, so they go out and leave me alone. So I could do my science, you know, I needed my <laughs> laboratory to myself. <laughs> right. Uh, so um, <laughs> then I just uh, figured out how to make the telescopes. That's awesome. And um, then my sister, my older sister, got married and left me a dressing room, which became my lab, <laughs> a chemistry and physics lab. And um, I wish I'd taken a picture of it because, boy, I had all kinds of equipment. Do you come, and from, I, do you come I from a big family? I actually did an experiment, a chemical experiment, and I disproved somebody's theory from 1899. <laughs> <laughs> But I never published it because I was too busy at school. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it still standing, or I mean, has it been re has it been I revealed? Don't think at this I, point? I think I got the. I have to find my lab book on that. I think I know where it is, but I'm not sure. That would be but funny. It was potassium permanganate and oxalic acid, and there was an, uh, in, in, um, a ruby red intern state that. Um, it turns out that they thought it was some complex of oxalic acid, potassium permanganate, and I proved that was false. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, These so, landmark experiments, you know, the world, <laughs> world can't go on without them. That's it right. was a classic experiment because it was in chemical kinetics, and the reaction went very slowly. So for a special project in college chemistry, I did the experiment, and um, one of the solutions looks like grape juice. <laughs> so I had a, a, contain a baker that was clean with grape juice in it. I said, I can titrate this perfectly, and I drank the grape juice. Of course, it, <laughs> I drink the potassium, potassium permanganate, or I'd be dead. <laughs> 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 All right, so so you were hanging around uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory when you were a high school student. Yeah, what I would do, it, it was interesting. I was thinking about that today. My mom got me a clock radio, and every so often, about every six seconds, there would be an RF, or radio frequency, interruption. and go, uh -huh. And uh, so what I did is I found out that was the Bellatron running, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. So what I would do as an undergraduate, they had these little shuttle buses, and I'd get on a shuttle bus, and, and I'd watch the other people, and they looked um, um, kind of bored and not very happy, not very unhappy, just sort of neutral. So I acted like them, and I'd get off and 
tour to Bevatron by myself and um, spent quite a bit of time up there. I had fun, and sometimes I go to the lectures. <laughs> That's great. And how old were you when you were doing that? Oh, about 16, 17 in there. And eventually you ended up going to Berkeley uh, for, for school, right? Yeah, yeah, I did my undergraduate in physics and chemistry. I got a master's in nuclear engineering and a PhD in nuclear and astrophysics. And were you uh, one of the few, I mean, there weren't many women doing physics they and were engineering not. back then, were there? Every course I ever took in physics had no women, except for me. <laughs> Started out like a sore thumb, and it was... Um, it, it got mean, you know. Hmm. Uh, I had a junior level physics professor, and, he, and I asked him when his office hour was, and he said, don't bother coming because I hate women in science. So I kind of figured, what kind of grade am I going to get from him? <laughs> oh, my God, Nick. But then when we taught freshman physics, hmm. and he was fair to me. He was nice. Uh, I I was shy, but I asked questions in class because I figured I better get the stuff down right. Right. Uh, well, I got the highest grades in some of the physics courses, and I got two years in a row the highest grade in calculus. <laughs> well, I bet you they didn't say too much after a while, right? Well, they still were, didn't want a lab partner with me. It, it was. Uh, and uh, I've heard that with other women. They sabotage their equipment in lab. Oh, and, man. And chemistry, it wasn't bad. It was okay. You know, you weren't supposed to talk in lab, which was a problem because some things would strike me funny, and I'd run outside and laugh and come back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but, uh, some ha but then, you see, about half of the undergraduates in chemistry were women. Oh, maybe uh, 48%, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by the PhD level, there was only 2% that were women. Wow. And I tell you, I mean, I was the only woman in physics. There was one woman that transferred in in my senior year, but I didn't share any classes with her. Well, I'll tell you something, as sort of a side note, before, before I called you, I had a young woman who was on the air with me, actually, uh, earlier tonight, and we were talking about the way, not just women, but the way people are treated in general out in public, and this is a young woman who actually works in the service industry here in town as a, uh, as a server at, at actually a real nice restaurant, um, but she was treated really poorly a week or two ago, and to the point where... It was something that she wanted to share with, with, with people. But, but, but in general, we were just talking about, you know, just people being nice to one another, really, and how there's sort of a... a Civil. Yeah, it's very... It's, 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 Civil, it's, I don't understand it. It's like there were some real important movements, like the Civil Rights Movement and things like that. But for some reason, um, just being nice and polite, I... I um, I try to, when I go through drive throughs or whenever I'm out doing um, business, I, I try to be, I try to cheer people up. Yeah. I try to be nice. Yeah, I mean, me too. It's just strange. Uh, and there's such angst and mm. animosity. And um, uh, I, I don't know, you know. Um, I will say it's better for women, but it's still... And minorities, it's, it's better, but it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so uh, let's get back to you for a minute. I have, I, I, I dug something up, and there's a guy who is named David Kaiser, and I'm sure you're familiar, but anyway, he's he's a he's a physicist himself. And, he's at MIT. Yeah, yeah, and he's sort of a science historian, I guess. And uh, anyway, he wrote a book a little while back. It was called "How the Hippies Saved Physics," and yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and it's basically about the group at Lawrence Berkeley that you founded and chaired that was called the Fundamental Physics Group. And yeah, I, I named it, and I thought I'll spell physics differently. <laughs> and um, I started that, and I got together with uh, George Weissman, and I had uh, corresponded with uh, Trieste in Italy uh, with uh, Jack Serfati and... 
Mm. Through him, I met Phil Paul Farag, and through him, I met Nick Herbert, and then through him, them, I met uh, Fred Allen Wolf. Mm. And so then I just got this group of about six or eight people together, and we met every other Friday. So Henry Stapp um, on the senior staff, and uh, the head of the department, Jeff Chu, would come to the meetings. We ended up with 40 people meeting once a week for about uh, almost three years. Wow. I had David Baum speak, and uh, uh, it wow. was about the foundations of physics and uh, what is the nature of quantum measurement and quantum entanglement. And um, it, it uh, was, you know, what is consciousness? What is the foundation? The, of our perception and what do we perceive and how do we perceive it and how do we create science and how is science and religion related hmm. well that was quite a group that you had together there for a few years yeah and man I tell you I was doing, uh, writing papers working full time raising a son <laughs> ah busy well, some of the stuff that came out of that, actually, I think were sort of unpopular at the time uh, in, the, in the sort of physics community. But eventually, at least in part, I think some of that stuff formed the basis of quantum information science. Uh, right. It is the basis. And it kind of took over. Um, what I said is we really uh, need to understand as much as we can about the conscious perception how do we create mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a concept how do we describe nature and what are the rules like causality and object grouping and the very fundamental nature of our perceptions and so um i also did some remote viewing work with the group um related to what how put off and russell targ were doing at sri and, and then I went down there for a couple of years. Okay, so so Elizabeth, for, for people who aren't familiar, SRI is the Stanford Research Institute, which was, uh, I think it still exists under a different name now. What yeah, do they call it? S now it is SRI. It used to be Stanford Research Institute. Oh, so now they just call which, it SRI. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's, uh, it's like Lawrence Berkeley was to uh, UC Berkeley. Yeah. It's the research branch. It high powered and high energy because what you had to you you operated fully on grant money so you had to keep writing proposals while you're doing the research <laughs> and uh, the research was done in the radio physics lab <laughs> at sri and um it was intense fun and enjoyable and i tend to like to do things i enjoy and uh for some reason i just really enjoy science and I, Really enjoy physics. All right, so uh, you have a recent book. Your most recent book is called Mind Dynamics in Space and Time, and I think it's related to some of the stuff that you were actually investigating at SRI. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Mind Dynamics in Space and Time, a physicist's view of the nature and properties of consciousness. And it's on Amazon. It was published last year. And what I explore is about 80 different remote viewing experiments I was involved with or that I um, set up with the Berkeley Research Group. Okay, which hold was on. another group I started, and then one with the Fundamental Physics Group. Elizabeth, and, hold, hold on for just a minute. And so, so let's assume that our audience isn't familiar with what remote viewing is. And uh, Okay, yeah, let me take a step back. What it is is our ability to perceive uh, a target location randomly chosen that is blocked from ordinary perception. And what the experiments usually involved was having a series of targets picked by a person not any further involved with the experiment. And a target those would are be... locked in a safe, and then and the tar of those targets are put in envelopes. And then a person randomly chooses one of these targets when they're in their car and they have a 15 minute drive time. At the lab, uh, closet is away from, and now you have to worry about cell phones and everything. Mm. In the 70s, you didn't have those. Uh, 
our subject person would try to perceive this random target that was going to come up. Now, the thing is that some of the people we used were just people like the secretary or the engineer down the hall because uh, some of my research was low budget, like no budget. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's our ability to see beyond space and time. Like people have precognitive dreams. And sometimes those dreams have saved their life or other lives. Hmm. And it's about the real great nature of our non-local mind that we can actually connect with others in a profound way. And if we just realize how interconnected we are in the non-local entangled universe, we just behave politely, for one thing, and with love and compassion is another thing. I was curious and I always wondered about psychic phenomena, so I did my own experiments and then I did the ones that SRI and suggested we do the long distance experiments coast to coast. And those are all enumerated as to how the protocol was, uh, how we did it, where the experiments were done, who they were done with. And then it's, the second half of the book is a theoretical model to show that psi is not incompatible with the nature of physics, but actually may be part of a subset of the so-called standard model uh, in terms of complex geometries, which I've developed the whole theory, has been published in papers and in another book called Orbiting the Moons of Pluto, Solving Einstein's Maxwell's Dirac and Schrodinger Equation in complex space, which was published in <laughs> World Scientific in 2011. Also, I'll interject and write two more books. <laughs> what are you writing about? Well, uh, one book is going to be on um, medicine. Good. On, on uh, a gentler um, patient-based medical model. And the other one is on some geophysics work I did with my second husband. Who I was married to for 20 years. Hmm. All right. Um, I have a question that came up from one of the audience uh, listeners here. And since you mentioned medicine, I know you've uh, you, you've shown some interest in the last few years in the field of psychic healing. Or oh yes, we did a whole series of experiments on psychic healing. Well, do you have any conclusions, or, yes. or would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, uh, what I did is one of the people that came to my fundamental physics group, by the way, it was almost all men, uh, but Beverly Rubeck, who got her PhD in biophysics from UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. worked with me on a series of four-year experiments with a model bacteria culture. So we got a psychic healer, Alga Worrell, who was very famous, and... Um, verified by doctors where cancers disappeared and so forth. And so she uh, was uh, Russian aristocracy. Mm -hmm. So we get it set up in the lab to do the model experiment, which Beverly had worked on for her PhD. And what it is is to have Salmonella typhimurium, which is a mild pathogen, uh, study growth and motility. So. We're getting ready to do the experiments and we'll have controls and then treated samples where she cups her hands near the test tubes, which are sterile and sealed mm -hmm. for about two minutes. And this has been published. And so anyway, she comes with a pillbox hat with a net and a mink coat. So we're trying to throw a lab coat on her, <laughs> like, sneak her in the lab. <laughs> But we did four major studies in which we made the bacteria sick with antibiotics of different types and different strengths. And it was a very, very good experiment that Beverly had. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got absolutely phenomenal results. I mean, the motility lasted far longer than any of the controls or any of the baseline studies. The growth rate was way off the charts with her. And then we had a grad student blind to the nature of the experiment do the same thing of cupping his hands near the test tubes. 
and that was just like the control. So it was her intention to heal. Hmm. And we showed them in the microscope, and she, they looked like little light dark dots in a dark field microscope. And so she said, they're cute little critters, so I can heal them. And then I said, if someone is sick with some, uh, salmonella, who would you heal? And she said, the highest form of life. <laughs> 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 which might have been the bacteria of some people but anyway um, just in case I uh, before the experiment I asked the bacteria a permission to do the experiment well, I just in case you know I remember a story about a guy whose name was Emoto uh, he was a, a Japanese scientist and he did similar things with water do you First remember name. that? Yeah. And what he did is he had test tubes with water in them. I, I don't know whether it was distilled or what what the properties of the water were. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the sterile test tubes, the water that the bacteria are in were distilled. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he did is had people cup their hands near the test tubes with different intentions like love, compassion, hate, jealousy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then the crystals, that when he crystallized the water into uh, ice, the crystal forms would look ugly for the ugly thoughts mm -hmm. and beautiful for the beautiful thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy, and I don't crazy. know how controlled the experiments were, but the ones with Beverly, I mean, because it was based on our PhD mm -hmm, dissertation, mm -hmm. were very well controlled. Wow. You know, there are stories from, I, I know a story from the Philippines where there were some men and women there that were, they're, they're almost like shamans, I guess, I would say. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I did study the Philippine healers. Uh, I say one in particular, go ahead. But they would do what they actually called psychic surgery, and and I don't know if it's, if, if it's just... Uh, I think some was palmed. Yeah. And chicken blood, and you'd have to test that. Yeah. But I did see one case, uh, actually several cases, with one healer, uh, Arigo. And um, what he did was, he actually did real surgery, but he just uh, used, um, this guy had a, a, a growth on his shoulder. And so he took this uh, surgeon's knife, which I don't know whether by then it was sterile or not, probably not. And he just cut his arm open and and he talked to him, of course, in Portuguese. Um, and so the guy was sort of hypnotized. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he just took out the tumor and put it on a plate, passed it around. There were some MDs there. And uh, then he just taped it shut. <laughs> and... Um, like uh, the guy was in a trance, but then he did a healing on a woman that didn't speak Portuguese, and she was in a lot of pain when he stuck needles in her. He stuck a needle through her hand. It was really kind of gross. Oh. But I took pictures of this, and I wrote uh, wrote an article that is now in a defunct journal called East West Study of Psychic Phenomena. But I did take pictures and. Um, that's just so much to explore. I mean, you know, what's fantastic is my idea was to figure out everything in life if I could. It <laughs> may take 10,000 years, but <laughs> I get started on it. But man, there's so much more to learn. Oh my God, Nick. And there's so many wonderful young people. I tell you, I'm totally impressed with some people in the millennial and younger generations. It's like they get it already, and they don't have to study for years like me. <laughs> Let's hold that thought for a minute, and uh, it's the bottom of the hour. We're going to take a break here, okay? Play a piece of music, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more. And I've got a, plenty of questions here for you, and I've got plenty of people here that are knocking on my door on email and text messages that have oh, questions good. for you as well. So we got plenty to talk about, but uh, we'll have about four or five minutes here, and 
take yourself a break and get a glass of water or something, and we'll be back in just a few minutes, okay? Okay. All right, everybody, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. My guest is Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. You can find information about Dr. Rauscher on the web at Elizabeth Rauscher. That's R-A-U-S-C-H-E-R, ElizabethRauscher.org. And a quick web search on Dr. Rauscher will yield all kinds of interesting things, okay? All right, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit. And before we go any further, I would like to say hello to some friends out there. Everybody who's listening, thanks for listening in. I've got friends all over the place. I won't go into names, but I will say happy birthday to my friend Brad out there. I meant to, to mention this at the top of the hour, but sort of forgot about it. Got kind of kind of caught up in some stuff. But anyway, Bradford, happy birthday out there, and uh, hope you're having a good night. And we're going to play one here, not necessarily for Brad, because I really don't have anything for him. But uh, I will say happy birthday and hi to all my other buddies and friends out there. This is Mike. You listen to Radio Orbit, KOPN Columbia. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. Sister. 
to cry Her friends said never mess with a married man They take all the shit to leave you lonely at the end of the machine All right, the Ina Cook Band. You listen to it on KOPN Columbia 89.5 FM. My name is Mike Hagan. This is Radio Orbit. Great stuff from Ina and the band. They are based in St. Louis, although Ina and her brother Ando are from Madagascar originally. And very interesting couple of folks and great band and great music coming out of st louis if you want more information you can find out about them on the web at inacook.com that's a-i-n-a a-i-n-a cook inacook.com all right once again it's mike this is radio orbit and let's say hello again to my wonderful guest dr elizabeth rauscher hi liz hi hi mike it's good to be with you it's great to have you on the air hey um while we had a break there, I had a note from somebody, and they said to ask you a question, so I'm going to, because it was a decent question, and they said, uh, Dr. Rauscher is obviously a traditional scientist, well-credentialed, but seems to be interested in the stranger side of things as well. So the question is, how does someone with your background get interested in the paranormal and so-called psi phenomenon, things that we've been talking about, remote viewing and precognition and perhaps uh, psychokinetics, that type of thing? Well, my feeling was that the basis of science is to understand the nature and properties of consciousness. Hmm. And without uh, uh, understanding how we perceive, how we create, Like a good example is how does mathematics relate to the physical world? And that's a profound question. And how does making up mathematics, where mathematics was developed before it was applied to physics, how did that relate and how did it give the results that we find uh, experimentally verified over and over? I will say this, though, about the Higgs particle. There's more evidence for psychic phenomena than there is for the Higgs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for the uh, type 2 uh, supernova expansion at the edge of the universe, there's uh, much more significance to the psychic healing of the bacteria. Now, I got interested because I wanted to study all knowledge. And I actually taught a course on world religions and philosophy. I had a group at Livermore Lab when I was out there Mm -hmm. uh, called the Tuesday Night Club after my father's father had a group. Uh, He was an MD to explore um, the... What I found is there's accepted truth and there's there's uh, unaccepted truth but there's accepted falsehoods and there's unaccepted falsehoods. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have to really search through um, very carefully, and this applies to psychic phenomena as well as I studied um, a number of motor generator systems uh, for like the UN and Virginia Institute of Technology because people were claiming free energy. But I found that there was always an explanation. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, uh, how did I get interested? Obviously, I had some unusual experiences. I'll I'll say, I'll tell you one. I was walking down the street on a nice sunny day when I was about seven. Mm -hmm. And I was going to go get an ice cream cone. Except I realized my older sister would have been with me because I wouldn't have been allowed to go on that route alone. Okay. As soon as that happened, man, I went slamming back into my body (sighs) and scared the bejesus out of me. I felt like I was dying and being reborn. (sighs) So that got my attention. And I wondered how that happened. But it's not that uncommon. I know when I was teaching at Stanford, and uh, teaching, uh, teaching, and then doing research at Berkeley, I was very tired, mm-hmm. commuting back and forth. 
And sometimes I would sort of feel like I was going out of my body into the back of the room and then I'd evaluate my talk. I'd say, oh, that's a pretty good point. Yeah, that's not bad. The key was getting back in my body <laughs> and not miss a beat. The Bible Savior say, if you miss a beat, you're dead. <laughs> I've had I've had some weird things happen to me along the way too that I can't quite figure out and I'm sort of a scientific minded person I I'm, I don't have near the background that you do but I do have a degree in mathematics and a degree in physics and I'm I'm sort of rationally minded but I've also had things happen to me that just do not fit the mold they they're definitely something they don't uh, fit d- our social religious societal agreed upon premises which we're brainwashed with and the first big brainwashing comes when you go to grammar school Hmm. i recommend canceling it it would be good and i'm i'm a guy that's right in the middle of it i've got i've got two sons that are uh, one is 12 and one is 15 years old right now and they're in the wow they're in the public school system here in columbia missouri and luckily we actually have a pretty decent school system here and and i try to supplement them with you know with other stuff but man i tell you what it's it is a minefield out there it is a minefield and actually um I think I'm a pretty good authority with all my degrees, but um, I, I think uh, grammar school is failing the kids. It's very different in different locations. You'd think Berkeley was good. Uh, my son went there, and uh, it's not good, and now I have grandkids there in school, and hmm. oh, it's just um, they learn in spite of it. And I'll have the teachers' union down my throat. Well, okay. <laughs> well, in a weird way, you kind of got to learn about the, uh, in other words, the only way to recognize it is to learn it first and then realize what it really is, maybe. You know what I mean? Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think you need to learn, which is the natural way that children learn, is if, you know, they'll explore one thing or another. But it's to make a completeness about that exploration. Mm-hmm. If you just do everything by rote memory, then there's no romance or mm-hmm. curiosity, mm-hmm. satisfied, or no, um, no of the natural um, bent towards desiring to know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a conundrum uh, because so many of the children, and I mean, not just here in our country, but uh, you know, all around the world are, are in a similar situation where they're being taught not much about the natural world, like you said, growing up in the woods or growing up somewhere close to nature uh, and learning about that side of it as well. I mean, it's basically just sort of an indoctrination rather than a learning sort of thing. I know. I don't know. I don't know. The, I wish I did know the answer, but I don't. Hmm. But I think that um, parents I think parenthood is extremely important, and a person really needs to be committed to doing that and to take more active role in their child's education hmm. and um, and to spur their curiosity. Well, it's rough when a lot of the parents don't have it. You know, you I know. S- you know, I do- I don't know. Well, uh, that's not what we're here to really talk about, although it is interesting because we are in the middle of a sort of a cultural, I don't know, impasse or something. I mean, clearly uh, things aren't going the way that most people would hope, and I'm not sure even people know how they would like things to be. But I'm certainly, not sure they do either. I, I think it's like it's hard to step back from it all with all the different aspects mm. of um, societal participation and and rights and um and i i don't know you know it's uh it's an ongoing saga and if you want to get depressed watch the news Mm, yeah i don't (laughs) i I, yeah i don't i don't watch it i try i try as little as uh i try very hard not to watch it i did this responsible thing i used to watch two hours of news a day (laughs) i couldn't take it anymore i said man Help, I can't take this. Yeah, I mean, you'll get it by osmosis anyway these days, you know. Yeah, uh, that's true with all the media. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you, the Internet is a real revolution. It is really uh, amazing. Um, 
Uh, it's got a great potential, and I hope uh, I hope not too much harm. Yeah, it's amazing how it started out sort of, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, people were using the Internet for email and things like that primarily, and now it's a, it's a center of uh, communication for the whole world, and pretty much everybody uh, uses it on a, on, on a regular basis. On the remote viewing work, we used to use the ARPANET. Which, right, um, right, right, which was sort of like the, the first that incarnation, was the predecessor right? The of the Internet was right. the ARPANET. Mm-hmm. And um, Al Gore said he invented the Internet. <laughs> he probably promoted the ARPANET, uh, but then uh, the guy saw, oh my, uh, the guys that developed the Internet saw all the financial benefits, and of course the PC was being developed. Uh, Gosh, I, I remember uh, some of the early versions of the PC, and boy, were they terrible. <laughs> yeah. All right, so speaking about remote viewing and precognition and, and some of the psi phenomenon, how do you think that that relates to life in the world? Uh, or Science is the interaction between... Uh, theoretic hypothesis based on observation and experimentation. Mm -hmm. But where does the inspiration come from? Mm -hmm. Like uh, Kierkele, who developed the carbon on the um, benzene carbon model Mm -hmm. of six carbons and six hydrogens, was staring into a fire and he saw six snakes eating each other's tail. Mm -hmm. And then he realized what the structure was. Mm Mm-hmm. So where and um, where does any creative thought come from? Uh, how is it that these children are born knowing so much and so advanced? And wh- what uh, you know, what causes that creativity? Well, the basis of science, and although um, uh, Einstein was not pro sci, he kind of indicated that that's where some of his ideas came from. And um, I had a lot of consulting jobs, like I worked on the NASA <coughs> space shuttle on uh, in t- uh, increasing the integrity of the wellment of the main <coughs> hydrogen oxygen tank. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, how in hell am I gonna figure this out? <laughs> so they sent me a carton of books and papers. I read them, but then I got, an insight into how to pursue increasing the integrity of the elements, and I did. We did. We did a series of experiments, and it was actually Using successful. A water. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so I just I uh, said, well, we'll use clear and photography, and we'll use um, electron microscopes to analyze the materials. And so we did a whole bunch of experiments, and uh, NASA got patents. I didn't get them because I was consultant. Of course. But um, then the Challenger accident happened, and then they suspended mm-hmm. all research for several years. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, the relationship between physics and consciousness is something that I know you're interested in. We've sort of been touching on it, but uh, most people... I don't know, myself included, probably would be like, well, how can you even connect the two? But I guess the brain... Well, what does the physics? I mean, somebody's doing the physics. And I was, I did some experiments at the Bevatron. So, Tell people what that is. What's Tevatron? Uh, as an ex- a proton accelerator. At the time it was operational, it was the biggest accelerator in the world. Mm -hmm. It's out there in California, out at Berkeley. I was in California. It's not there anymore. They trashed it. Mm. Oh, made me cry. (laughs) Uh, A beautiful machine gone. (laughs) But anyway, um, the thing is, no matter how objective you think you are, everything is motivated by a motive. Mm. I mean, people have motive. Why? Mm. Why did the young grad students, uh, the students that I had in my research group, want a PhD in physics to impress their mom, to get a job, to study reality? Mm. I mean, they had all kinds of motivations. You can't separate out a human being from the doing of the process. And that's so true in quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement Mm. and Bell's theorem, which I'll describe in a minute. Mm -hmm. The point is that we interact with the world. 
we cannot see without looking. <laughs> um, the photoelectric effect is a good example. So I have a beam of light shining on a metal surface. The light kicks out electrons from the surface and causes a current flow. So when you walk through a door that automatically opens, you break the beam of light mm -hmm. and the door is triggered to open by that current flow. Mm -hmm. I cannot look, uh, I cannot perceive without looking. So the perceiver is part of the equation. You can't draw a circle around reality and say it's all out there and are separate from me. And I'm just uh, on a completely objective pinhole. That's just not the case. Uh, uh, physics is the study of the structure of consciousness, said uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, a famous physicist. And uh, we, we, we cannot take ourselves out of the equation. We are the equation. Nature is us. Us is nature. Hmm. So... Consciousness is is a product of the. F Ooh, now we get into skinny. Right. In other words, okay. I mean, how, how does it even arise? It, it's, it's a physical process that must arise from physics. Okay, here's the answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I think. What I. That's a great is, answer. This first is of all, yes. philosophy and mm. my belief is. The ultimate reality is consciousness. It is the plenum of all existence. And some got precipitated out as matter. Like 10% of the action is the matter that we perceive. Some of it's very definite. That is, if you run into a brick wall, you'll notice it. Notice the uh, vent. But uh, in fact, I think there's so much more to reality that is to be discovered. And it's, uh, I think it's almost like an ongoing mir uh, mirage, you know, when you're driving down the uh, old roads in the back country and the sun was at a certain angle, you see this mirage like water on the road. As you get closer, it just scoots off into the future. And so it's like, uh, is knowledge ever going to end? And uh, some of the physicists that say we almost know everything, <laughs> And one of them was the head of UC Berkeley, David Saxon, who is a physicist, said, we almost know everything, and it's not what Elizabeth Rauscher, Charlie Tart, or Jeff Michelow think. Mm. And so they must be wrong, but we almost know nothing. <laughs> but what's good about that is we have so much more possibilities of really a much more harmonious life and I was just reading about, hearing about the Yemen and the children starving there, and uh, it just really bothers me. Mm. But there's nothing I can directly do about that. But can some of these profound world problems be somehow solved? But it's got to be somehow where the ego is. And what I said with the fundamental physics group is I said there's an imaginary basket here put your egos in the basket and walk in the room. <laughs> and the room that we had uh, for the lectures was Lawrence, uh, E.O. Lawrence, so, um, the head of for the star at LBL. It, it was his old office that we used to meet in. And I kind of think the vibes were special. But yeah, you know, it's like uh, all our experiences are listening to the music that you had, and there was a horn that remi reminded me of Miles Davis. And uh, yeah. it's all these creative things that come to us in science and music and sound and poetry and painting and, um, and even uh, such things as the Magna Carta and the Constitution and, you know, that... Uh, that we're driven to try to strive for the better. Mm -hmm. And we have to inspire mm -hmm. people to do that. And what I have against education is that the normal, most children are born happy, not all, but I mean, but, um, and it's only the environment that uh, crushes their creativity and their potential. Yes. And it's, uh, what school was is shut up 
and listen to me and don't believe yourself. And so I told my students when I was teaching at Berkeley, um, don't shut up, uh, question me, mm -hmm. and uh, think for yourself. Mm-hmm. And decide whether I'm wrong or right, or makes sense or don't make sense. You know, we got a we got a franchise, is a franchise, back to our young people. You know, there's something that uh, I want to read to you here. I came across it the other day. I'd had it for years. It was an old, old sticker that a friend of mine gave me, and I put it on my guitar case, and I hadn't really thought about it, but I but I came across it the other day and it was a quote from, from the Buddha and, and this is what it says and I'd like to get your, get your comments on it. Believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. The Buddha. Oh, I, I really, uh, I've been very interested in Buddhism and Buddha. I spent quite a bit of time in Asia and China and Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought that in to, that when you look at the roots of Christianity and the different religions, that the common ground of the different religions is right. Mm. But then we have the dictatorial that Congress in, oh, was it uh, three something AD, where they decide what would go in the Bible. They oh, were the, the, council, the reincarnation. Yeah, that was the, the, they took out. the Council the of Nicaea, is, I think. Uh, that's right, yeah. the Congress of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that you have to start from believing. You've got to give a person the right to believe themselves. Mm. That doesn't mean they need to be insane and, <laughs> you know, be violent. But... Um, we're taking that franchise away hmm. and the mass-produced education stamped out and although it sounds good leave no children behind no hmm. child behind hmm. the thing is we have to um cater education to all all different students with their different rates of learning hmm. yeah learning is not an even curve it's it uh, fluctuates over time, and we don't educate the emotions. We say, shut up, sit still, and listen. We're not educating the self-perception, your self-confidence, the, the aspects of, of um, who we really are, and just trying to pigeonhole everybody, and that isn't mm -hmm. going to work. Yeah. Yes, I agree. All right, well, it's time for another break, believe it or not. We've already done another half hour, so we're top of the hour here at 1 o'clock in the morning. What is it, midnight where you're at? It is uh, midnight. Midnight, okay. So now we are now into the 20th of November. Stick around, Elizabeth. We'll be back in just a minute, okay? All right, everybody, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. My guest is Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. You can find information about her on the web at elizabethrauscher.org. And a simple web search will find all kinds of other things about Dr. Rauscher. All right, it's Mike, and we're going to take a little break here, play a piece of music by the Ina Cook Band. This one is called Doctor. We'll be back with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher in just a few minutes. <laughs> Doctor, cause my heart is beating faster and my knees are getting weaker. I tell you by the day, do you think it's serious? Or am I being delirious? Or has this fever melted in my brain? Well, let me tell you.
There's another one from the Ina Cook Band. That one's called Doctor. You can listen to all that stuff on her new record. It's called the Ina Cook Band. And you can find information on the web at inacook.com and also on my website at mikehagan.com. Just click on over to the music archives and you can check out anybody who's been featured on the program here in the past, okay? Tonight, Ina Cook from St. Louis. Love that stuff. All right. Uh, and I also love Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, and I'm so glad that you're sticking around with me tonight. Hi, Liz. Hi. Hi, everybody. Are there some, uh, did, you said there were some um, questions, so I'd like to take questions. Well, okay. I've got, I've got a couple that came up uh, uh, during the break there, and the first one is... And, and it's a, definitely a scientific question, and uh, it has to do with the time independency of experimentation. A listener asks, and I'm going to try to par- I'm going to try to to, uh, to paraphrase here, but it has to do with the a priori assumptions of scientific experimentation. And Ooh, one, one, one of the first assumptions is the time independency of experimentation, which basically means that uh, if you do a experiment on Monday morning, it shouldn't matter if you do the same experiment on Thursday afternoon, you should still get the same results. Uh, This person is questioning that assumption and saying that the that you really can, and I think they call it the return to initial conditions. Isn't that what they call it? Yeah, what it is is presumably if I if Galileo rolled balls down incline planes and looked at pendulums swinging, mm-hmm. if I do the same experiment, it shouldn't matter how long it's been since he did the experiment. And it shouldn't matter where. So if I do it in Russia mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or I do it here, it doesn't matter. That's a good assumption. It may not be true of all reality, however, mm-hmm. because there's, you would say you have to repeat the experiment over and over. Right, right, there's right. one experience everybody has that's listening, and that is their birth. There's only one case where you uh, have this life, and it only took one experiment to know that that's the answer. Mm. That you exist. And it can't be repeated. And it can't be repeated. Never. The confluence, as one guy points out, all the dinosaur shit and stellar uh, gases mixed together made you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Unique. Yeah. Remarkable. Right? I mean, I really. I think I want to return to one thing on education. Yes, please. And this is a true confession. Mm-hmm. Not never been done before, but I am proud that I was kicked out of third grade in public school. <laughs> now, what I did is not do what they wanted, but I didn't do anything wrong. Hmm. However, I was nearsighted and couldn't read the board. In fact, I couldn't read the board all through high school and college until my sophomore year when I got myself some glasses. But my dad would say, when I said I couldn't see that, he'd say, none of us need glasses. So that was not a particularly good lesson. But <laughs> anyway, I'm proud to say, and then the next year I went to a private school, and I went from third to ninth grade math all in one year, and I was accused of studying too much. I think there's a little bit of disconnect there. Mm, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's crazy because I see um, I see sort of two things at the same time with regard to education. I see an extremely poor system that's trying to educate a, a, a larger and larger number of children and, and really not having the resources or, or really anything to be able to do it effectively. Sort of there might even be some nefarious, uh, uh, you know, intention behind some of it because I think there is sort of an idea. I don't know about the dumbing down. There might be. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's happening one way or the other. But regardless, there's also a huge amount of resources that are popping up that are outside of the classroom. There's a uh, there's one in particular that I'd like to mention because it's been so helpful to me and my family with regard to not just mathematics, but uh, science in general. And this is a thing that's called Khan Academy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Khan Academy, but it's no. ba- it's an, it's essentially an online university that is 
geared towards children. And for example, with mathematics, I mean, you can start out with the most simple, you know, what is a number? You know, start out with that. Uh, and then. Yeah, what is a number? How did we arrive at numbers? Right. Where did they come from? Exactly. In fact, in fact, I think I'm going to ask you that question in a minute. But, but Khan Academy is that, is that thorough that they actually start really at the basis of things and then just go through mathematics, you know, one plus one is two, and then up through grade school, high school, and eventually up into very high level mathematics. And you can learn it all online for free. And it is absolutely, uh, uh, remarkable what, what what they've done. I'm 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 thrilled with it. But at any rate, uh, mathematics. Uh, you know numbers. Uh, well, you know it used to be one, two, three, uh, and a lot more. Mm. But it's interesting because animals can count. They, they this farmer had a crow that was in his barn. And he didn't want it there, so he wanted to go in and shoot it. <laughs> but um, the crow, when he came, would fly out. So then he took two people, and then one would leave. The crow knew that there was another guy still in there. It got up to nine people before the crow was not able to count. <laughs> Unfortunately, he lost his life for not solving that mathematical problem. <laughs> but um, counting is so innate. And uh, it's interesting to watch my grandkids. Um, there's, there's certain, uh, this is advice for our grandparents. You have to bring a lot of gifts. <laughs> That's your duty. Uh, it's assigned to you at the moment you become a grandparent. <laughs> right. But they all have to have equal value. They don't have to be equal in number necessarily. But they have to have equal value no matter what the age of the grandkid is. And actually that's true of children, you know, that they need to feel that they're equally valued. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So are you, are you have two boys, 12 and 15? I do, yeah, yeah. Freshman oh, in high so school. Exciting. Yeah. I tell you, well, I'll give you another example on education. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could volunteer at Lawrence Berkeley um, Laboratory to take people on tours on the weekends, mm-hmm. on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to do that because I like um, teaching. Sure. And uh, so you get kids around 10 to 12 in there, and my God, they're just all over mm-hmm. uh, with questions and good questions and excitement and uh, just uh, wonderful and then I had toured some teachers, and they were so bored, mm, and they mm-hmm. were so uninterested. Mm. Uh, I think the education had um, made a meal. Mm. Well, I think that we should talk about something called the imagination, and Ooh. and what it is and how important it is in the development of a of a human creature because i think that children like you mentioned still have that and oftentimes older folks uh, even even young adults uh, because of the nature of the social uh, cultural context that we all live in the imagination has been sort of squashed to a certain extent so please uh, uh, speak to that. that might be along with uh, psychic perception hmm, you think they go together when, okay uh, let's talk about that when i was raising my son um up until about two he, i i play hide and seek with him and man he was good and then i would uh just for the fun of it i would crawl in under his bassinet when he was sleeping and he'd wake up and start bouncing and giggling and then as he got involved with other people, then that psyche perception or that knowing where I was at got less and less and less, and I could play hide and seek much more, uh, much better as, uh, as he got older and got brainwashed. <laughs> so the brainwashing isn't just what is said, but it's what's done and what is thought, because thoughts are real and have real consequences. Yes, I agree with that. And and so back to the imagination, where does that come from? In other words, in other words, you ha- you have Well, you have to I think it's a built-in. See, there's certain things like Immanuel Kant's object grouping and um categories mm-hmm. of existence 
and causality. I think that that's inborn. That there's, there has to be a pattern that the brain has that makes it viable to survive uh, evolutionary, evolutionary-wise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so um, what one needs to do is imagination, of course, if you're camping alone in the woods, and you hear something, and you, you listen pretty carefully. And I've met quite a few wild animals while I was camping alone in the woods, mm-hmm. which was a wonderful experience. But you um, imagine what their intent is, but they're imagining what your intent is. Because, hmm. you know, they, they have to figure out what you are. And I will say animals do behave differently if you're just camping alone and you're not with a bunch of people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they, a wild animals will come up curious about what are you you're trying to imagine mm-hmm. what what is this creature mm-hmm. and is it dangerous and is it not dangerous is it a a meal on wheels or what <laughs> right you know I have uh, I have some experience underwater I I, I like to scuba dive and the reaction of animals under the water is a lot different than animals on the ground. In fact, oh, absolutely. it's crazy because they're so unfamiliar with humans in the water. Yeah, they are. I, I used to do skin and scuba, and, I, and uh, I was actually diving in a place you're not supposed to dive, but I like to, <laughs> of course you were. Like to dive there, so I would <laughs> swim around to that point. Mm-hmm. There was little seals, uh, bobs his head up kind of a distance from me and trying to figure out what I am and so it dies down then it gets closer and then it, it looks again and then it dies down and looks closer whatever it decided I was it said I'm beating it out of here as fast as I can <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know you know it's like uh, I woke up uh, camping where you're not supposed to camp and uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of a rebel. But anyway, I, uh, I hear scratch, scratch, scratch on my sleeping bag in the early morning, and it turns out to be a baby bear. <laughs> and I'm just curious as to what's in that bag. It's kind of warm in there, and you know, I'm imagining what I am. And as I started to move, it went up a tree, but then I was concerned about mommy bear misinterpreting <laughs> and imagining my intentions to be other than they were. So I rolled up my bag and walked backwards facing her, and she stopped where her uh, baby had gone up the tree. But yeah, everything's imagined. There has to be imagination or nothing can exist because they can't figure out what expect a causality aspect Mm -hmm. i think that it's interesting that the word image is part of the word that it's 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 we give so much value to sight but oh it was so interesting there's certain smells that that i can smell you know, when I went back to the country where I grew up, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. people owned the land that I knew, so they let me just, I was acres, uh, 20,000 acres to hike in. Wow. Um, and so I just uh, go off uh, for a couple of weeks, and I asked my mom what she thought when I just drew, there's no cell phones, of course, and what, uh, and then we used to ride in the back of trucks. My God, there's so much we miss now. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to love doing that. Uh, but anyway, she said she just figured I'd come back. <laughs> but um, I knew my life was in my hands. Mm. Uh, I could get bitten by a rattlesnake or something or mm-hmm. break mm-hmm. an ankle. Or, but just there was a different autonomy mm. and a, a different lesson. And imagination, I mean, kids are just so full of it. It's just wonderful, and uh, they, it should be encouraged. And I was picking uh, Christmas gifts for my grandkids, and a friend I was with suggested I get things where they build stuff and um, make something. And I think the kids, are with all the media, the, there's not too many kids that want to build their own stuff. Mm. 
But if I had the money, I wouldn't have bought telescopes. I wouldn't have built them, but I wouldn't have learned how to build them. Isn't that the truth? Well, they say the necessity is the mother of invention, right? Right. And so I learned a lot by having some poverty years. Mm. Yeah, I totally understand. And I think that it's a, the technological uh, thing that's happened and that's that we're in the middle of. It's still happening, I guess. And by that, I guess I mean the development of miniature electronics and the fact that we now have very small devices that are extremely powerful and oh i mean it's amazing i mean uh that will date me but i from the days when they showed you a whole basement of computer mm. uh here's the computer and here's the cards and Mm. There's the pu- key punch machine. And right, right, right. You go at it, man, and maybe you can find someone that will tell you what to do. <laughs> right. Well, now, now we've got kids that are essentially glued to these things, and and they're. I know my grandkids. It was so interesting. I have the middle two or uh, eight and tw- uh, no nine and twelve, mm-hmm. and. Um, so they were looking up grandma on the internet and they found sites that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> and pictures that I didn't know existed. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if, if, you, if you put your name in a web search, you're going to get all kinds of stuff out there, and uh, which, which is a testament to you and, and your, your catalog of work, actually. And uh, you should be really proud you've done some remarkable things over these years. I've been busy and I decided... <laughs> The knowledge doesn't come to you automatically. You have to work for it. Mm. That's a that's a, a concept that's been sort of lost, I think, as well. The idea of actually working hard for something, you know. Yeah, I mean, I used to do all nighters, and I did eighteen hours when I was doing my first physics book, mm. a unifying theory of fundamental processes. And man, I can't I can't haul ass like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was doing all nighters on my income tax, and now I I, I try to plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Before we're we're going to take a break here in a few minutes, but before we go to break, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about um, about your own personal philosophy. In other words, uh, you're a woman who's had a lot of experience and also a lot of actual knowledge uh, of, of the world and how it works and I'd like to ask how it's affected your own philosophy over time in other words do you still look at the, at the world the same way you looked at it when you were a younger woman or, or have the things that you've experienced and that you've learned through your research and experience you know have, have they changed the way you think about this whole thing well it's interesting uh, one experience I had is my parents didn't get a babysitter, so I was about between nine, maybe seven or nine, and they invited me to go. I went to this these wealthy people's house, mm-hmm. and they were very educated, and I um, so I looked at what they had and had knickknacks from all over the world, and I thought, I want to be a world traveler. I want to really go around the world and I did and what I see is a commonality um, I guess I guess the important things to me are compassion mm. and love and that probably was true of, as a child um, I had two very strict severe parents so we didn't get along um, I would say Knowing psi, a psi phenomena is real is one thing I learned. And um, it's sort of an accumulation of so many things. I'm actually kind of revisiting, hmm. thinking about what I think about things. <laughs> and, uh, do, you think, do you think we'll ever get a rope around the psi phenomenon where we can actually utilize it as opposed to just sort of observe it and say, wow, that was well, weird? They did, and- use some of, they did do, use dowsers in Vietnam. It has been used to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, there's also the negativity uh, that says it doesn't exist, but that's perceived te- telepathically. And it's also about shut up and listen in school and don't believe yourself. Mm-hmm. 
And so if that keeps promulgating, it's going to be hard to to make a change. But I think where it's going to be is a revolution. There's a revolution in physics, which I guess I um, as a uh, I don't know that I'm a verifiable hippie. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, but um, I think uh, without uh, those changing and relaxing, but I still think we're probably on a revolution. Uh, there's a big surges, surging in, in studying these effects in uh, the 70s, and I think there's a reemergence at a personal level, at a, a self-developmental level, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm just surprised at some of the young people and. Like, uh, it's just uh, second nature to them. They assume that Psy exists. They don't need to prove it beyond what they believe. Hmm. Yeah. That's a place for us to take a break, okay? Okay. All right, we got a half an hour left, and I've got a few more things that I'd like to talk to you about, and I think we'll also maybe open the phone line and see if anybody wants to call and say hi. What do you think? Fine. All right, we'll do it, and we'll see if we can generate some interest out there. I'll be back with you in just a minute, Elizabeth. In the meantime, everybody else, it's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia, 89.5 FM. The number here is 573-443-8255. If you'd like to have a chance to talk to Dr. Rauscher and get a question in, this is one of the few opportunities that you might have to talk to someone like uh, like Liz. So anyway, we're going to play a song here from Ina Cook, and then we're going to come back and we'll have another 30 minutes with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher before the two o'clock hour where the great Mr. John Lofton will take over and be with you until sometime early tomorrow morning. Okay. All right. In the meantime, like I said, once more, the Ina Cook band, this one's called Baby's Walkin'. It's Mike. You listen to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. Oh 
song there the Ina Cook band and you're listening to it here on KOPN Columbia 89.5 FM my name is Mike Hagan and this is Radio Orbit and I have with me on the line the wonderful Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher hi Liz hi Mike how are you doing I'm good how you doing thanks for sticking good. around so late it's like uh, it's like 12 30 in the morning now there for you yep <laughs> well you're a night owl like me I can tell well actually I rested up <laughs> I normally work at night, but I decided I'd take a nap. Well, I'm sure glad you decided to do it. So, all right, a couple things came up at the break here. And uh, first of all, I will give out the phone number again. If you'd like to call in, the number is 573-443-8255. I'll try to keep my eye on the phone here and pick it up if I if I see it. You know, it'd be nice if we had a big flashing light here in the studio when, when somebody was calling in. We really don't. You got to kind of really look at the phone. And I tend to get uh, distracted sometimes. But anyway, uh, in the meantime, I will ask you if you are familiar with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, yes, I know him well. Well, I think he's fantastic, and I have for years, and he's certainly somebody who has a credential similar to your own. I think he's a Cambridge University professor. I'm not sure if he still works there, but... Uh, I don't know, but anyway... But a very, 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 very uh, smart and skilled and talented guy, and he actually is very interested in some of these same psi uh, experiments that you're interested in. Um, he, uh, uh, met him, gosh, well, his idea of morphogenic fields is very interesting. Wonderful, yeah. Because if, uh, even, um, see, I think it was, trying to, um, remember, some of the ancient Greeks mm. have studied the embryos and noticed the similarity between different mammalian embryos and human embryos. Mm-hmm, okay. Um, uh, Aristotle and it's very interesting that how does a thing form into what it is how does a thing become what's the template the morphogenic field to create that particular species or animal or plant or mm-hmm. rock or whatever and how does it how does it form into what is becoming you mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I think some of his ideas, like um, when the uh, monkey's on one island, a mother monkey learned to throw her uh, when you put rice. You, they threw rice in the sand to feed the monkeys. Mm-hmm. But the, the monkey had to pick out each grain of uh, rice from the sand. So one mother monkey threw it in the water and the rice floated and and the sand fell and so she could just scoop it up and so then the monkeys on that island began to learn from her Mm. but spontaneously on a distant island where presumably the monkeys couldn't migrate to Mm -hmm. the monkeys learned to do the same thing very interesting yeah very interesting so what was you thinking on rupert I like him, and I, to be honest, I haven't, I haven't read much, much of his recent material. I'm familiar with, he wrote a great book many years ago that's called The New Science of Life, and he was, oh, yeah. he was a plant physiologist, I think, initially. Anyway, he just had a, had a very, which shouldn't even seem novel, but his idea was, you know, in The New Science of Life was basically look at things while they're living as opposed to trying to look at them while they're dead, <laughs> you know? Right on. Well, I tell you, I wrote a, an article because um, uh, his original book um, that someone had written an article saying a book for burning, and I thought, my mm. gosh, mm. talk about. Mm. I mean, it's like uh, 
talk about censorship, it's ridiculous. Velikowski was another one oh, that was so censored. Believe it or not, I mentioned him earlier today. He he had a birthday. I think it was either yesterday or the day before if he were still alive. And and he he's one of my favorites uh, uh, with regard to not, not just his understanding of history, but also psychology. He was such an interesting psychologist, you know? Uh, history and psychology and his world in collisions was mm. very interesting. And I Absolutely. read it. Yeah. And then there was, uh, our, in San Francisco, there was a IEEE, American, hmm, I can't even remember that, uh, American uh, Association for Advancement of Science. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so Carl Sagan and a group of people were, he was invited to speak, and so he spoke. And then uh, uh, Carl Sagan and his group uh, spoke and um, uh, just, just, they ambassadored him, and they and Carl Sagan hadn't read his book, World in Collisions, yet he was damning us. Hmm. So I went up to Carl Sagan afterwards, and that's why he didn't like me. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, at least if you're criticizing something, you better read it. And um, Absolutely. he just had a fantastic, broad knowledge of... Uh, Historical events correlated over the world over time. Oh, man. So that's why Carl Sagan, I think, was lambasting me on the BBC and saying <laughs> that I studied psyche for nominal. <laughs> not even if I find out whether it's true or not, I'll destroy all the science and all the civilization. And I was really tired. I just flopped down on my bed at the hotel. And, <laughs> and that's what he said. <laughs> Well, isn't it amazing, though, too, because, you know, really, and, and you mentioned it earlier in the program, is that the idea of science is to ask questions about stuff that we do not yet understand. And, and Right, and is, science, is psyche phenomena of science? Yes, if it's interaction of experiment and theory, hypothesis, test, and uh, experimental verification, the answer is yes. Hmm. And I wrote that on a poster on a course I was teaching at Berkeley on the philosophy of science. And I had people that would just like walk across the hall to avoid being near me for just asking the question. Hmm. Yeah, amazing. Uh, like I had the plague, man. <laughs> it was hard. It was really, uh, I really felt uh, alone a lot of those hmm. years. You know, you're not the only person um, in, in your business that has mentioned that, that I've spoken to. I have a number of sort of uh, rogue scientist friends uh, who, are, who are very well educated and very well credentialed like yourself, but, uh, but have a difficult time because their theories or their ideas aren't particularly accepted. And there is, a, there, there is sort of a self-censorship thing that happens in the scientific community itself that is a oh, little oh yeah it's very much it has it has overtones of a religion and mm -hmm, i mm -hmm, said mm -hmm. that one time to the fundamental physics group is science a religion and um three out of 40 people laughed so <laughs> i think three out of 40 considered it <laughs> but man i don't know you know i I I guess I really I'm an optimist and I think things will get better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I sure do see a lot of turmoil in the world. Yeah, I do too. Human caused. Mm. You know, oh, I gotta say one thing about Rupert Sheldrake. Yes, please. He used to say herb instead of herb, <laughs> and I said, "Oh, what well, you're saying, herb? It's supposed to be herb." And he says, "I'm English. I can say it any way I want." <laughs> That's just the way he is, too. He's got that great English sort of arrogance that is uh, that's sort yeah, of endearing. He, you can only uh, have it if you're English, you know. Uh, I tell you, I was fortunate. I met so many wonderful people. You, so you, many in my travel. And um, there's some amazing folks that have swam the current the other direction and uh, <laughs> paid the price for it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you definitely have had uh, some remarkable relationships and experiences. I will ask you um, about, speaking of that, you were involved for a little while at least, I'm not sure how long, in something that was called the Resonance Project. And I oh, know yeah. uh, Nassim Haramein and I know Dr. Heisen and some other folks were involved in that oh, at yeah. least for a while. Yeah, Michael Heisen, he's a sweetie pie. He's a great man, yes. And we keep in contact. We, uh, 
we talk quite regularly. Um, yeah, I was involved with the resident project for about uh, three years. Mm-hmm. What's your question about it? Well, my I guess my question has to do with energy because one of the things. Oh yeah, that's a very important issue. Yeah, and I think that I think it really gets to the root of a lot of the trouble that people have on Earth is the fact they they they, they just energy, don't have enough to do what they need to do. Territory. Mm. Yes. And if we could solve the energy problem, we solve a lot of wars. Yeah, abso- absolutely. At seven, I told my dad I would try to end war. Mm. However, as you see, I've been singularly <laughs> <laughs> unsuccessful in that one. Well, you and, every, um, you, you anyway, and everybody else who's tried, so don't feel bad. Goes, uh, in high school, I knew there'd be war, wars over oil in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. I knew that energy would be a crucial problem. That's one reason I went into nuclear physics, besides studying the very small and the very large, mm-hmm. to see what a reality is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I wrote my first paper that was published when I was a sophomore at Berkeley on fusion energy, and that's something I've been pursuing over the years. And I, I feel like... Uh, the fossil fuels are finite. Uh, the carbon, there's a whole bunch of debate about the carbon imprint mm-hmm. and um, global warming. I did present uh, a couple of things to the UN uh, on energy systems that were viable uh, that need to be explored, and then also on the environmental issues. Um, mm-hmm. The thing is that uh, there's probably some natural and man-made uh, global warming. There was a mini ice age in the, the Middle Ages, and so the sun does put out different energies at different times. Absolutely. So I don't know how much is man-made, but we, we uh, you know, since high school, I knew we had to get off of fossil fuel. Hmm. And nuclear fission looked like a viable idea. But I knew in high school that you had to deal with the nuclear waste. With the waste, yeah. And if you had something radioactive for 80,000 years, <laughs> what civilization has lasted more than 400 years? Mm-hmm. The Roman Pax Romana is the only one that is about 400 years, and the lead and the wine vats got them, massage over extension, <laughs> and egos. Um, but, you know, we have to deal with this, and Fusion is getting a new input, and some private companies are getting involved, and I've been asked by a couple of companies to come up with proposals on my idea of how to do it, and um, so I'm working on, on that as one of my projects. Well, that's a big but one. that's I, important. Oh, it's my so gosh. so important, because I did an MIT study on wind and solar, and it... it it's really not going to be able to do it. Hmm. Uh, they had a bill in this state that by 20, 2022, I think, mm-hmm. that uh, ha- uh, over half of the energy had to su- be supplied by alternate energy. Mm-hmm. And they calculated that uh, the average person would be paying one to $2,000 a month for power because... It, the, you have to have an energy density, and that wind and solar is not. Just haven't um, achieved that yet. Yeah. Uh, it cannot. It, it theoretically can never achieve it. Right. The, the the volume necessary just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, like hydroelectric is fifty percent of Oregon's power is produced by. Mm-hmm. But that um, that's a unique. So each state is so different, but we need to really solve this problem. Yeah, there needs to be and, sort of a break. Uh, I agree so, with that. I think uh, there needs to be some sort of a breakthrough sort of technology that really changes the whole dynamic of the thing. Right, and I think it's fusion. Wow. Well, I hope you're right, and I hope you keep working on that, okay? Because we need your help there, Ms. Rauscher, all right? Man, I get my ass in gear. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're running short on time, so i got to get a couple more questions in here. You mentioned looking at the small and the big. And oh, yeah. I- when I was a kid, I thought to myself, if I'm going to figure out why my life sucks, that's when I was about four. 
I got to say, the very small and the very big, mm. and then about, you know, nine or ten in there, I knew about atoms and whatnot, so I wanted to study uh, atomic and nuclear physics and uh, astrophysics, and I realized it would probably take me 10,000 years to figure it out. <laughs> But I better get started. At least if I if I don't try, nothing will happen. Well, and then there was a relative on my dad's side of the family that said, gain and disseminate knowledge and make the world a better place was one of his uh, ideals. And I thought that was a really good statement. It sure is. So I would ask you this. Um, as a person who has looked at the small and the large, I find it remarkable, and I think even a child... Uh, it sort of just seems like common sense when you learn or actually look into a, a microscope or a telescope, they they look the same. In other words, even down at the molecular level, you have atoms and yeah. electrons that are spinning around atoms, and then you also have you know planets and moons that are spinning. Everything is spinning around something else, and it all sort of uh, like a spin- like a fractal spinning, thing. Rotating has torque, hmm. and what's interesting is. Things in nature like to be round. Mm, yes, yes, yeah. Hey, uh, Elizabeth, let's hold on for a second here. I think we have a caller that would like to join us here. Hello, okay. who's there? Hi, this is Deborah. Hi, Deborah. How are you tonight? Well, um, I wanted to say something about her questions on consciousness. Yes, please, please, please do. So... I think that when I have questions or something, I put out an intent of some sort out there into the larger collective, Mm -hmm. and it's like maybe a future self or a future collective, kind of along the entanglement theory, can connect Uh, and start building itself. I'm having trouble hearing you, but what I understand is you are asking about how you... Create something in your life by putting intent out, and you know what? The universe does answer. That's why your intention has to be very clear, but that's one thing I learned in life. And it's like not having psyche phenomena as something to study this other, but to live a life uh, cognizant of perceiving that way, and uh, you've got a wonderful secret. Because it is about putting your intention out and then creating that reality. And there's four major goals I had in life, five major goals, and I've accomplished four. So <laughs> um, it's about that if you think about something enough, you'll create that, you'll understand it, you'll imagine it, you'll uh, understand it. Mm-hmm. You sort of have to imagine it, you have to imagine it first in order for, you, for it to even have a chance of being. Right. All right. Well, th- thank you, uh, Deborah. I'm, I'm, I think we must have lost her there. But at any rate, uh, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that. We've got a time for a couple more questions here. Um, I have a friend who sent me a note and, and was commenting on our conversation about education and children, and she said uh, something to the effect of, education is great if you can get a good one, but the value of a good mentor who is very good at, at something that you want to get good at is 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 really something that... That, that people could really benefit from. And maybe you could talk to that a little bit, the idea of having a good mentor. I think a good mentor is very important. Mine was sort of virtual in the sense that I um, admired and uh, followed the work of Einstein when I was in high school. I was trying to explain relativity <laughs> to my <laughs> classmates to little avail. <laughs> And Nikola Tesla, but I, I, I um, most of uh, most of them were men, but they were people I hadn't met, but just an image of someone and saying their life and hmm. what they went through and how they created their own uh, way of uh, inventing and creating and imagining, and. Um, uh, but a personal mentor is really, really important if. If a person can find a special you can find person one. Yeah, to yeah. inspire them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I've been I've been fortunate to have one or two of my own and man, I don't know what I would have done without them, to be honest. Yeah, I would have um 
Yeah, particularly in high school, I think I would have liked that. <laughs> Mine came sort of later in life, but uh, at any rate, if you can get one along the way, you're doing all right, you know? Yeah, what I do is I, you find someone that has a lifestyle or something you want, and then you imagine how to get it for yourself. And I notice that everybody that's pretty much colleagues and friends, they all have libraries, and every wall in my place is full of bookcases full of books. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few of them, too. Hey, uh, we've got another caller here. You want to take one more call, Liz? Sure. All right, hi, who's there? It's Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit. This is Deborah. I wanted to say something more about... Um, I live alone. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in nature. I resonate with all the things she talks about. And I study a lot, and my house is full of books. But um, the one thing about the interior self that our culture does not really let us get in contact with, a lot of people think there's nothing inside them really when they have to think about things or feel and just sit and listen. And we're not empty inside at all. Mm. And I agree with that. We I, I to... think that we need a combination of socialization and friends and also the solitude, the being alone, mm. uh, to explore your own thoughts, feelings, imagination, creativity, and just what it is to be a human being and what, what one's life means and giving it meaning and having meaning. I agree with you, Deborah. My my creativity and ability to navigate in the world very much depends on having time alone mm-hmm. and being able to think and ponder and start pulling things in and listening. Whatever is ticking, flashing inside me, responding to my questions, if I listen to that, I have to be alone to be able to put it all together, and it starts building itself into some kind of a form that I can grasp. And somewhere along that continuum, material comes out of that, you know, a reality. But you have to learn how to put all the different pieces together from past, present, and future. And there's other selves of myself up further along in the future that seem to sometimes answer or give me clues. And I just wanted to say something about that, that uh, we all as a culture need to learn how to look within and listen. Mm. So anyhow, thanks for not cutting me off. <laughs> not at all. I agree with that for sure. And uh, I would say 30 years of meditation changed my life. <laughs> all right. Well, look, we are just about at the end of the rope here. So I'm going to have to say thank you so much, Elizabeth, for spending the time with us. We need to do this again. We've got so much more we could talk about. I feel like I could have you on the air all night and <laughs> and, and we could just uh, we could just talk talk for a long time but we'll also do we'll plan to do a show and have michael uh come on the air and talk with us as well and um anyway now we're back in touch and we'll do it again and i want to thank you so much for all the time you spent and for your insight and your knowledge and and just for the remarkable woman that you are i'm I'm thrilled to have a chance to talk with you and i'm proud to proud to know you i enjoyed it mike and i really was glad to be on and um Good going with the future. We'll get Michael Heisen on. We'll do it again. I'll talk to you soon, okay? Okay. All right. Bye, Dr. Asher. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. It's Mike. You listen to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia. We've got three minutes left. I'm going to get out of here with one more from the Ina Cook Band. Next week, you will have uh, Jay on the air. I'll be back in a couple weeks, and I think we'll have Dr. Paul Laviolette, or um, I don't know. I've got a, I've, I've got a few things uh, in my in my pocket here. So anyway, stick around, enjoy the holidays, and take care of yourselves. Stay cool. And once again, if you want to hear this program you can check it out on the web at mikehagan.com and everything else that we do is on there as well so we'll catch up with you in a couple weeks in the meantime enjoy yourselves and one more from Ina Cook here this one is called Fool in the Castle it's Mike you've been listening to Radio Orbit on KOPN Columbia 89.5 FM stick around we got John Lofton he's going to be with you till the morning hours and I'm not sure exactly what we're going to have for you maybe a little Abbott and Costello coming up in just a bit
Cause we get the bill 